Okay, well, welcome tonight. Uh, this is week 10 of our deep dive Bible study in the book of Genesis. And welcome to New Beginnings Christian and Missionary Alliance Church. I'm Pastor Danish House. Got folks around the table here we can't really see. We got folks up there on the Zoom bar whom we can't see, but uh, we have lots of people participating today. Uh, if you are uh, participating by Zoom, I hope you got your uh, handout email. Uh, and uh, if not, then you can pray that you know, check your email. <laughs> um, here is a handout for tonight. Um, if you are watching this on YouTube later on tonight, it's uh, what is it? Tonight, April twenty first tonight. April 21st, 2021. If you're watching this later on on YouTube, you can send an email to church at newbeginningscma.org and we will send you the handouts for this Bible study. Um, let's pray and then we'll jump in on our study for tonight. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this evening. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you for the, the word of God which is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. Thank you for the opportunity for us to study it together. Thank you for the Holy Spirit whom you have put into each uh, person who is part of this study. And Lord, I pray that uh, the Holy Spirit would, uh, would fill us and, and would empower us to share uh, what we see in your word because you've equipped us each to be students of your word and to, to teach one another. So God, I pray that that would happen tonight, Lord, and I pray that you would speak to us, that we would hear your voice, and we would do your will. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Um, yeah, so, great. Let me move my chair. We'll, uh, we'll get graphic. Uh, oh, I need to tip the screen back a little bit. Lynn, could you just tip the screen back just a nudge? There you go. So if I come close, then my, my head wants to be so Okay. So uh, we're digging into the story of Noah's flood, and we're using the manuscript Bible study method. You guys all know that. Um, before we dig into our manuscript for tonight, I wanted to talk about a, uh, a, Bible, um, a Bible study uh, uh, structure that I think is very helpful for us to know at, when we're looking through uh, texts in the Bible. It's, it's, it's the sort of thing that uh, is used in the Old Testament in narratives, it's used in the Old Testament in poetry, it's used in the New Testament in narratives. Uh, it's a very, very useful tool to, to know that authors in the Bible times on a regular basis. Um, and it's called a chiasm. C-H-I-A-S-M, chiasm. It's a literary structure. Uh, it's, a, it's a way that authors in the Bible uh, communicated through the, the structure of the text uh, messages about what's important in the text. Basically, a chiasm is a fancy form of repetition. Okay, so we, when we do the manuscript Bible study, remember that we, we look we listen and we live. And while we're looking, we're looking for, one of the things we're looking for are things that are repeated. Well, chiasm is a very fancy schmancy way of doing repetition. Um, and it, what it does is it uses what's known as uh, inverted nested parallelism. Okay, inverted nested parallelism which just explains it all, right? That's, that's, that's all you need to know. Um, probably the, an easy way to, to um, teach what a, how a chiasm works would be to use a, a palindrome. Do you guys know what palindromes are? A palindrome is a word that's spelled the same forwards and backwards, right? Uh, or, a, or a phrase. Does anybody have a palindrome that you particularly enjoy? Race car. Race car, okay, great. <laughs> R-A-C-E-C-A-R, -E okay? Race car, it's a palindrome. If you, you spell it forwards, it's R-A-C-E-C-A-R. If you spell it backwards, it's R-A-C-E-C-A-R, okay? So let's take race car and use that as our example of how a chiasm works. 
a chiasm uh, in the text. Let's just do this. R A C B C A R. Okay. In a chiasm, there'll be a, a, a sentence or a uh, or a, a, a particular word or phrase that's used here and here. Okay. So there's repetition there. But then there's another phrase, a different phrase, or a different word or a different sentence, okay, that's repeated here. Okay. And then there's another phrase or another word that's repeated here. And then there's something in the middle. Okay. Um, so this R parallels this R, and this A parallels this A, and this C parallels this C, and then there's in the middle the E, okay? Race car. Um, and just to get fancy, this would be R, and this would be R prime, and this would be A, and this would be A prime. So you see, and this would be C prime, and that would be E, okay? So you have two Cs, one that's a normal C, one that's a prime C. Here, okay? that's, that's the way nested parallelism works, okay? It's nested like this. These are these are nested structures. Okay, they're, they're, they fit together, um, and it's inverted in the sense that um, you go out and then you go back in, right? It has this this movement of it builds, 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 and then it re recedes, recedes, recedes. Inverted nested parallelism is a chiasm. Here's yeah. Go ahead. Is that the length of the sentences or uh, no length it, of the words? It's just saying that it, it builds to a, a climax in the middle. The meaning. The meaning. Okay. Yes, the meaning okay. builds to a climax in the middle. Um, and what's in the middle of a chiasm is the most important thing. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the reason authors use a chiasm is to highlight something in the middle, to comment on the thing in the middle using these things on the outside. Okay, now we've, we've encountered a number of chiasms already in the book of Genesis that I've not pointed out, okay, which took tremendous restraint and you should all praise me. Uh, I want to go back and hit on a, just a very simple one that was on uh, the page three of your manuscript. So again, if you're using our manuscripts, it's on page three. Our manuscripts are eight and a half by 11 sheets of paper that, where the text is typed out double spaced, uh, page three of your manuscript um, in the book of Genesis, that's uh, chapter two, Genesis chapter two, verse three. Um, so we're looking at page three, line seven, okay? So it's, it's the Toledot, you see the Toledot there, okay? So these are the generations of, what is it the generations of? It's the generations of the heavens and the earth, right? When they were created. Okay. In the day when, uh, in the day when, when. The Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Okay, so what do you what do you have here? You've got the heavens parallel the heavens, right? You got and the earth paralleling the earth. You got when they were created and the Lord God made. And in the middle is in the day when, okay? Or at the time when, or, you know, in, mm -hmm. in the, so this is, this is actually a, a chiasm where the middle is not the most important part. What I'd say is the most important part is all of this, which is who did the creating, okay? So this, this in these two inner nests are the, are the main point of this little chunk. But, but do you see how the chiasm works? The heavens, the heavens, the earth, the earth, when they're created, when, in, when they were made by God, right? And in the day when in the middle. 
So this is how this verse is structured. It's just a fun little thing, okay? Mm -hmm. um, you sort of work your way into the chiasm and then you work your way out of the chiasm. And the way out is very similar to the way in, okay? This is how chiasms work. Um, why is this important? Well, it's important. Uh, it's, it's fun in Genesis 2-3, uh, but it becomes really powerful in a place like the story of the flood, okay? Now, I asked you why you were reading the flood story this week. I asked you to pay particular attention to uh, words that talked about the duration of the flood. I encouraged you to ignore dates, uh, but to look at, at words and phrases that, uh, that communicated the duration of the flood. How long did the flood story last, okay? Now, you could just add them up, okay, and come up with a number, but that's not any fun. Um, what is the, but, when you, when you start to write these out, what you see is that there's actually a chiasm at work here. And I'm just gonna walk you through it. In your manuscript on page 11, page 11, line seven, there's a, there's a word that talks about duration. What's that word there? Seven days. Okay, so seven days. They have to spend seven days waiting for the coming of the flood. That's in manuscript 11, seven, okay? Then in 11, 14, there's another one. What's, what's in 11, 14? What's a duration phrase that's there? Seven days. Seven days, okay? So there's another seven days. Okay, interesting. And then in manuscript 12, uh, page 12, Line 12, uh, so they, they uh, no, I'm sorry, 12-2, 12, two, 12 two. So they wait seven days for the flood to come. They wait another seven days for the flood to come. And then the, then the rain starts. How long does the rain last in page 12, line two? 40 days. 40 days, okay. And then uh, manuscript, 12, 12, it talks about after the rain, how long did the flood extend after the rain? 150 days, okay? Now, if we look at manuscript 12, 16, what do we see at 12, 16? Another 150 days, so something happens after the first 150 days, and then there's a second 150 days, okay? All right, and then what about 1220? Page 12, line 20, there's another one. 40 days. 40 days of waiting, okay? And then we go to page 13, line two. Seven days. We get seven days. Noah sends out a, a bird, right? Bird returns, he sends out the, the raven. Uh, bird, the raven returns, no place to rest his foot. So he waits for seven days. At the end of that first seven days, he sends out another raven and it returns, and the, he sends out a dove and the dove returns with a, a flesh, freshly plucked olive leaf, right? And then in 13.5, what do we have? So seven more days. He sends out, after seven more days, he sends out the final dove and it does not return, okay? So chiasm, seven days, seven days, seven days, seven days, 40 days, 40 days, 150 days, 150 days. Do you see the nest that's being built here? Now, the question is, what lives in the middle of the nest? Okay, what's the nest there to highlight? What happens between this 150 days and this 150 days that changes everything? Another one, right? No. 
Not, not, the water doesn't go away for another 150 days. What, what? Oh, I God see remember. crazy. God remembered Noah. Okay. So you have seven days, seven days, 40 days, 150 days. God remembered Noah. 150, 40, seven, seven. Right? The point of this chiasm is to highlight the point of the flood story. The point of the flood story is God remembered Noah. We'll talk about that more later on. But the chiasm highlights the point we're supposed to get from the story, right? That God had not forgotten Noah. Uh, I, I guess I'll say this now. Uh, in, because I'm about to say it. Uh, is that in the Bible, remember is a covenant word. It's a word where uh, that, that says God was faithful to fulfill his covenant to Noah. That's what it's covenant faithfulness that's being talked about here. That God is going to fulfill his covenant obligations. Remember we talked about obligations last week. He fulfilled his covenant obligations to Noah. It wasn't that Noah had slipped his mind and I where did I put that Noah? Oh, there it is, right? No, not, this isn't remembering in that sense. This is God saying, I'm going to fulfill my, I am now going to fulfill my covenant obligations to Noah. Um, and, and that's what's going on in the flood story. Now, I'm going to just back up one more step and say, I've actually simplified this greatly. Um, depending on who's doing the study, the chiasm can have in, in the flood story, I've seen uh, chiasms that have like 14, 15 steps in the flood story. I'm actually gonna give you one right now. Um, this came in a second email to you. Uh, so I'll give that to you. Oh, sorry, good catch. Uh, there you go, there you go, there you go. This, this is a, and you guys, I sent this to you by email, so you should have this. This is a page out of the book, Rethinking Genesis. This is uh, by Dwayne A. Garrett, Rethinking Genesis. He's not rethinking whether Genesis really happened. This isn't a critical stuff. This is, he's rethinking the JEPD theory. And he's, what he's saying is it's, it's full of toilet material, okay? Um, and he, he's saying, look, Genesis is actually a very tightly written story. And if you try to pull it apart into different uh, sources, you wind up with something that's not Genesis. Um, and, and, he, and the parade example for this is the flood. And he, he points this out, he has, has this chiasm in here developed by Gordon J. Wenham that goes all the way up to P, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, O, N, M, L. And there's so many parallels here that uh, it's, it's frightening, <laughs> like how well constructed the flood story is. But always at the middle of it, it doesn't matter whose commentary you're reading or what's, what, uh, what, what, uh, scholar is looking at the flood story, doesn't matter how many levels to their chiasm that they'd find. Some people will, will quibble with Wenham's uh, thing here and say, well, that's not really a parallelism or whatever. Who cares? In the middle of it is God remembered Noah. <laughs> and nobody disputes that. That the, that the center of this story is God remembers Noah and that everything hinges around that. I think this is really cool. I think this is the kind of thing that blows my mind and I hope it's something that helps you as you're looking at the flood story to say, wow, this is a really well-written piece of literature. Thoughts or questions about the chiasm? Oh, I have one more. Uh, I have a question. It's Carol. The, the numbers that are in your, uh, this figure 1.3, I'm not quite getting them. I understand the Noah one because that's chapter six, verse ten, yep. right? Yep. And then what about what about the the fourteen, sixteen, the seventeen after the flood announced? I'm not quite sure what he, that refers to. He does this is it'll be chapter six until he says chapter seven, verses one through three in G. You see that? So it's chapter six, verse ten, A. Okay, got it. 14 to 16, six. So seven. you're in six and it's four, it's verse 14, 16 and 17, eight. Okay. Right. 
So you get it. And when you get to G, it switches to chapter seven. Yeah, I see that. Yeah. Which is the chapter eight. And then uh, F prime, it switches to chapter nine. Right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Here's a caution for you. Okay. And this is something they tell us in seminary. Once you start looking for chiasms, you will find them everywhere, even where they're not. Okay. Uh, so uh, you have to be very careful with this. Not that it's going to lead you wildly astray, but it's just really easy to get carried away with this and, and to forget that there's a point to all this, right? It, it, the point of this is not finding chiasms. The point of this is understanding the story. Okay, you can understand the story without the chiasm, without finding the chiasm. Um, but it's really, it is possible to invent chiasms in your mind. Um, and so uh, I think the Noah one is very clear. Okay, um, but there's many others where people just sort of find chiasms everywhere. And uh, just be careful with that. It, it's just, a, it, it can become a pointless exercise. Um, and I don't want that to be. But I hope that this will also give you a tool as you're observing to see cool things in the scriptures. Questions, comments? I don't know. It's fascinating. I've never even thought about the chiasm before. She said race car, and I thought, what she? <laughs> <laughs> well, race car is a palindrome, right? So, oh, yeah. like an, another, another palindrome might be radar. Right. I was thinking, wow. wow. Something simple. Mom. <laughs> there's, there's some really complicated long palindromes, but I, I'm not coming up with it. Yeah, what book was that? Um, anybody who's spoke of it, I Born Wood Bible. That's the name of the book? Poison Wood Bible? Poison Wood Bible. That one was full of palindromes. Was it? Oh my gosh, it's crazy. Isn't that crazy. Right? That he said for water. What about her name? Barbara or something. Kingsley, Kingsley, yes, yes. Kingsley. Anyway, whoever she is, she's famous for that. Okay, but that's the only book of hers I read, so I don't know if she has any others. Hmm. So I think a palindrome is just an easy way to sort of get the concept of how a chiasm works, but also seeing it in the scriptures is really helpful to do that as well. Thoughts, comments? Anybody on Zoom comment or question about chiasms? It makes me wonder if they wrote it. If did no one write this deliberately? this way or did somebody just figure this out after the fact and say oh look what you can do with this yeah no it's definitely deliberate on the part of the author um and and so that's a chiasm is worthwhile if it's something the author actually put in there right yeah. a chiasm is worthless if it's something that you just find there that's what I'm uh, that doesn't really exist yeah i mean this so, is certainly not worthless but <laughs> i think that i think that the uh the, the, that certainly a chiasm of this care and construction Focusing in on the number of days, right? Uh, it has to be intended by the author. Um, and the, why would they do this? Okay, so obviously they want to highlight an important point, but this especially is helpful if you are in an oral culture. If you're in a culture that does verbal storytelling, right. is yeah. to put in these hooks and these flourishes that help you to remember the story, right? Mm -hmm. And helps your audience to remember the story. And so uh, this is an, a primarily oral culture. The, the, there are people who could read and write were few mm -hmm. and far between. Um, the chiasm is there to either subtly suggest it in their hearts or to, uh, for people who are paying attention, to very powerfully uh, lead them through the chiasm to say, oh, wow, okay, we just hit the important part. Yeah, now I'm thinking, <laughs> Noah certainly didn't write in English. So, this like stays with it all the way through the translation? Well, my guess is, so my, my best understanding of it is that Moses later on, when he's composing the story, he writes the chiasm into place, yeah. right? He, Moses who's writing this down, uh, very carefully and artfully constructs the story so that yeah. the chiasm is in place. Not that, that he's inventing sense. details, yeah. but he puts the details in a certain order mm -hmm. so that- Yeah, you know, that makes like, sense. Uh, why does God remember Noah after 150 days and before 150? Why isn't this just 300 days that the, that the ark is is on the surface of the water? When did God remember Noah? 
who knows? I mean, it's, it's like yeah. what, what, what Moses is saying is at the heart of the flood, God is still fulfilling his purposes, right? And his, his covenant faithfulness to, to Noah. That's what Moses wanted us to know, okay? There's no, there was no camera or stenographer sort of sitting by the throne of God where God says, oh, I remember Noah. Oh, that was after 150 days, okay? Rather, what, what Moses is doing is putting that remembrance at the center of the chiasm mm -hmm. so that we will get it, so we will yeah. understand it. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. It's just amazing to think that when the translators could work it out so that it makes sense in English. Yeah. Because mm. Moses wasn't thinking of that in English. Of English, no, not at all. <laughs> so Moses, <laughs> yeah, Moses was only concerned with his people, I want to say, remembering this. Well, now it helps that, I mean, it helps that Hebrew is, in a sense, in the big family of languages that English is in, okay? Um, in that it uses oh. word, a word for a concept, one word for one concept. Um, for example, Chinese uses oh. a pictogram to communicate a whole bunch of concepts. And this sort of structure probably doesn't work in Chinese. This is my mm -hmm. guess. I, not knowing Chinese, I don't know. But, mm -hmm. um, but, but my language. guess is that, that this kind of construction doesn't work in the Chinese language, mm -hmm. um, whereas it, it would work in, in any <laughs> language in this large family of languages where it's word one mm -hmm. word, one concept. Yeah. Wow. Questions, comments on Zoom? I'm poking you each. Then we will go on and do our manuscript study of the flood story, part two. So last week, uh, we, is it wrong way to say that last week feels like a month ago to me? I just, this morning I was like, I don't even remember last week. It's just it's like month of April slowed down ah, somehow. Yeah, March is going down. We, uh, we finished our study on page 12, line one. Page 12, line one is where we finished last time. Again, if you're watching this on YouTube, this is what our manuscript looks like. It's an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper, double spaced with line numbers, but no, um, line numbers and page numbers, but no chapter or verse markings. So, uh, we start at the beginning of 12.2. Where do we end is the question for tonight. Where do we end our study tonight? Uh, as you guys read ahead and you looked and tried to find what's the end of a, a discrete unit, a unit that we can handle tonight, uh, where do you end? 13.10. 13.10. Thirteen ten. Thirteen ten. The earth had dried out. Yes. Boom. Okay. So that's one possibility. Thirteen ten. Thirteen sixteen. Okay. Thirteen sixteen is another one. Uh, Thirteen sixteen comes to Everything they went out from the ark. Period. Okay. So thirteen ten comes to the end of to the point when the flood dries up. 1316 takes us to when people leave the ark. Did anybody have anything else? Any other point? Pastor, I had two different ones, and I guess the one I'm going to choose is 13.6. Um, um, return to him anymore. 13.6. They waited seven days, sent the dove, and she did not return to him anymore. Okay. Right. Uh, you choose that one because the next line is in the 601st year. So there's a, there's a date marker in the next line that seems to break the story uh, there or be a comment on the story. Okay, good. Anybody else have something else? I had a, I had a break at 1322. 13.22, God, it's, it's just before God blesses Noah. So blessing is an important concept. Puts blessing as the beginning of the next passage. 
Um, you know, any of these would work. Uh, ultimately, the flood story ends on page 15, line 12. That's a little ways to go, a little long for us to go. Um, I think that what I'm going to say is let's try to take two pages today, and then we'll have just under two pages for next week. I think that'll be sufficient. Uh, let's go to where I had it, line 22 on page 13. Not because that's a better one, but just because that'll get us through this story, uh, finishing it up next week. Okay? I think it'll be more challenging. We have more text to handle. Um, so let's, let's break it there after the quotation. Summer, winter, day and night shall not cease, period. Put your break there. All right. So this gives us basically two pages to look at. Remember our procedure with manuscript Bible study is to look, listen, and live. Great. Um, I felt hard work. Uh, look, listen, and live. So what do you see here on page 12? We'll just, we'll keep it on page 12 for now. What do you see on page 12? What did you observe? Lots of specific dates and times. Okay, lots of lots of time references. References. Dates, times, lots of references. We we already made something out of that with the chiasm study, but there's plenty more, right? Uh, there's um, uh, in the seventh month, on the seventeenth day of the month, so. This has a great deal of specificity as to the timing. What's interesting about that to me is that if you look at the other flood stories, did I talk about the other flood stories last week? Yeah. Here's, the, here's the funny thing about the flood is that uh, if you look at all the other cultures of the ancient Near East, they all had a flood story. Um, and if you look at the, the cultures of Europe, most of them had flood stories. There are flood stories in North America. There are flood stories in Asia. There's not a lot of flood stories in Africa, but uh, around the world on every continent, there are cultures that have stories of a worldwide flood, uh, of a flood that wiped out all life on earth. Um, so that's just a fascinating thing. I, I don't know what fully to make of it. I want, what I want to say is, well, it's because it really happened and they all have a memory of it. That's fine, you know, but I don't think it's, I don't think it fully proves that, um, but it is fascinating. It is fascinating. It's fascinating to look at the differences between them. Um, and one of the major differences is that the Genesis story has a lot of time references, which nobody else does. What year did it happen? What month did it happen? What day did it happen? These kinds of times and dates are very unique to Genesis. Great, good observation, Nicole, thank you. All right, something else, somebody else, what did you see when you looked at this passage? Lots of water. Lots yeah. of water, yeah. So time plus water equals flood. <laughs> yeah, very good. Somebody else, what else did you get? Well, lots of water, the wind blew, I don't know where it went, but the water disappeared. Okay, so the, so the waters, they increase, right? They prevail, it says, and then they they uh, retreat, right? Or to where? <laughs> the whole <laughs> yeah. So that's a good question. So I'm just going to touch on this very briefly, okay? Just because I've done this with the rest of Genesis, so I think it's important to do this here. Is that there's a number of different uh, answers, Christian answers, to the question of the science behind the flood, okay? So. Uh, I don't know if you know this or not, probably you, many of you probably do, that the flood is one of those stories in the Bible that really separates Christians in their understanding of how the Bible and science interact, okay? Uh, here at, at our church, we've often done vacation Bible schools from Answers in Genesis, okay? Many of the, and Answers in Genesis, uh, it's a, it's a six-day creationism uh, group. They're, they've staked virtually everything on the 
universality and the and the um, and the uh, uh, global nature of the flood. Okay, the, the, they believe they firmly believe that the that the flood covered the entire planet. Well, first thing that and that the flood is what carved the Grand Canyon and other canyons around the world, creating uh, the the strata of rocks that are found in in uh, in rock deposits all around the world. Okay, that that basically the flood came through and just laid down layer after layer after layer after layer of sediment and rock, creating the rock layers that you see at the Grand Canyon and other places. This is called flood geology. And we talked about this back when we were talking about creation, okay? So for answers in Genesis and other six day creationist uh, groups, uh, their explanation of the rock layers that you find with, with fossils and in various layers, various strata, is that this was a result of the great worldwide flood. So they put a lot of eggs into that basket. And the big question that six day creationism needs to answer if they're gonna put their eggs in that basket is where did the water come from and where did the water go, okay? If the flood covered the entire planet uh, and what the interpretation is uh, in line, uh, line six on page 12, it says uh, the waters prevailed above the mountains covering them 15 cubits deep, okay? Uh, if let's say Mount Everest, okay, was covered to a depth of 15 feet, uh, 15 cubits, which is 22 feet, um, that's a lot of water. It's not just a lot of water, it's a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of water, <laughs> okay? Um, all the water that currently exists on the earth as ice, as water vapor, as underground deposits, if all of that water was turned into liquid water, uh, it would raise the ocean levels around the world by about two or three inches, okay? That's how much water we're talking about here, okay? We're talking about I, I, I read it somewhere and I don't remember the figure. You guys know I'm terrible with numbers. I might even be wrong about the two inches thing. It might be two feet, it might be 20 feet. If it's, if it's 200 feet, it's not nearly enough, right? Um, we're talking about hundreds of billions of gallons of water that had to come from somewhere and go somewhere, right? Where, where did that, where did the water come from? Where did it go? Well, there's a lot of great explanations for that, right? One is, Rain. it's a miracle, <laughs> right? Uh, God created the water and God took the water away, right? Is, is anything too difficult for God, right? That is the, that's, that's probably the best explanation. Honestly, as I've read other explanations, they don't hold water. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, which could be considered as potty humor. No, uh, but uh, in any event, um, sorry about that, people on YouTube. I'm going to edit that out. Uh, so yeah, God creating the water and God getting rid of the water. I don't really know that there's any other explanation that makes any sense. The other thing, though, is what we consider mountains. What I consider a mountain when I go out to Indiana and I talk to the people out in the flat and they go, well, look at the mountain over there. I'm like, that's just a rolling hill. Sure. <laughs> So, you know, there, we don't know what the, what the world was like at that point. I'm not saying that God couldn't dump. No, no. So, so another, another explanation, is, a possible explanation, is that through the geological upheaval of the flood, mountains were shoved up, right? So Mount Everest wasn't Mount Everest prior to the flood, but it was shoved up in the flood. That's another good explanation, and it's mm -hmm. certainly a possible explanation. Yeah, and the seas way. weren't as deep as they are now either. You know, with that taken out, and, sure. you know, if you level everything out, then maybe. Yep. I don't know. Like to go back to what um, when Dave said, where did the water go? And um, line fourteen caught my eyes when it says, "The fountains of the deep and the windows of the heavens were closed." So it made me think rain was coming from heaven, but 
I would consider the fountain of the deep, the ocean, the water also come up from there to flood the earth. Sure, yeah. That's so would the water go back, recede back into its original? Sure. It's, and the, and the, the, this, this, what scientists would ask is, where is that water now? That that's water does I'm not asking. exist anymore, right? That, that, that water simply isn't here. Okay. Um, and it's a lot of it that's not here. Um, now, it, the, there are, there's other explanations, though. Okay, so one one way that one way to think of this is that uh, is that this was a miraculous creation of water and a miraculous removal of water. Another way to think about it is that this was a there was a geological upheaval that created the highs and lows of our planet, but they were it was much more sort of uh, middle ground, so to speak, before the flood, and so it didn't take as much water to flood the earth. Um, another explanation, and you're going to hate me for this, but another explanation is the possibility that the flood was not did not cover the entire planet. Okay, um, this has been an Orthodox Christian interpretation of the flood story mm -hmm. since the beginning. Okay, uh, and that is that the purpose. What is the purpose of the flood? Why did God send the flood? What was the purpose of it? To destroy, to wipe out violence, and wipe out. Wipe out creation yeah. at that point. Yeah, All, everything that lives and breathes, right? Mm -hmm. um, if everything that lives and breathes was concentrated in a small area, still, right. you wouldn't need to flood Australia right. if there were no people in Australia, okay? You wouldn't need to flood South America or Antarctica if everybody was still fairly mm -hmm. concentrated in a small area, okay? The purposes of the flood could be carried out without it being global. Now, the problem with that is, doesn't the text say that it covered everything? And doesn't the text say that it covered them every mountain 15 uh, cubits deep? Well, and all it, the end mountains hmm. under the whole heaven, something in that. Right. Heaven. So, and I'm not, I can't go too deep into this, but just to say this, that if you, if you study everything under the heavens as a phrase in the Bible. Sometimes everything under the heavens means within a small geographical area. And if you study the entire land of the entire earth in the, in, the, in the Bible, what you'll find is that phrase sometimes refers to a limited geographical area. Here's a good example. Later on in the book of Genesis, there's a massive famine. Joseph uh, has been sold into slavery in Egypt, and he tells Pharaoh there's going to be a massive famine over all the earth, okay? And uh, Pharaoh then stores up grain at Joseph's instruction, and eventually, as the famine spreads, people come from all over the earth to buy grain, okay? Now, when you picture people coming from all over the earth to buy grain, do you picture people from Australia getting in a canoe and paddling to the Middle East? No. 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 It, it quite clearly means within a limited geographical area, right? within the area where we are. Yeah, I mean, everyone that we know was affected by the famine. Okay, um, that's just one example, but there's plenty of examples in the Book of Genesis and other places where over all the earth. A limited geographical area and we're under all the heavens it means a limited geographical area it's possible it's also possible to interpret the mountains being covered uh to 15 cubits deep uh as uh considering the mountains that were a part of their local geographical area um, there was an understanding among the cultures of that time that the sky was a dome that was that, that was uh, supported on an outer ring of mountains that ringed the, the surface of the earth. Those mountains were considered to be kind of the foundation of the sky. They weren't necessarily considered to be mountains, right? Really tall, but there was there were much smaller mountains that were sort of the foothills that were local and it's possible that it's talking about local foothills. It's possible it's talking about the local foothills of Mount Ararat, for example, where the real heights of Mount Ararat 
are, uh, you know, maybe we're considered part of the foundation of the sky rather than a separate mountain. You get into lots of issues when, you, when Noah, if, 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 they, if they're on the very top of Mount Ararat and Noah releases a dove, doves can't survive at that altitude. So it's, it's a very difficult thing, right? Doves are low altitude birds. Okay, well, lots of questions that you have to wrestle with. But if it's a local flood, if, it's, if it still was enough to wipe out all people and all animals within you know, uh, the area that, that the known world, if it did wipe out all people and it accomplishes God's purposes, the scriptures are true. And it's not, it's not as big of a scientific problem. But it's not a big scientific problem if God creates the water and moves the water either. It's not a big scientific problem if it caused the upheaval uh, of, the, of the tectonic plates. I'm just saying that there are multiple Christian interpretations of this some of which are easier to square with modern science. Details, right? yeah, too much science to them story. <laughs> I don't like it. I, I know you don't like it, uh, don't. but for some of us, these are the kinds of questions that keep us up at night, <laughs> right? So I, I just want to make sure that well, I- we get lost in the details rather than understanding what the story yeah. is about. It, it, yes, right. Yes. So in the end, what the story is about true. is what we really want to focus on. Yeah. But, there, but I do believe there's folks who make this the, Faith make it or faith break it question. Yeah, I don't think that's what it is. Trying to tear it apart. Any, so um, I shouldn't just dump this on you and not leave <laughs> questions or comments. So questions or comments on this, on what I've just taught, um, I'm very open to talk about. Crickets were probably on the ark. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I remember, um, I think it was last year, Amazon had these um, series. They weren't very long. It was about creation and the destruction of the earth. And they, they had said the same thing about the fossils of the mountain. Of and at one point, they were showing you how the animals were in the ark. And because they had found these things in the stone that depicted the shape of certain animals. So I, like that one he was saying, kind of made sense, but I was like, really? So I'm like, no, but I, just like you said. Cool. So what, what I'll say is that I think that it's a perfectly fine interpretation of the text to say that the waters covered the entire earth. The, the text can certainly say that, and the mountain, that the mountains were covered at that depth. The text can certainly say that. What I want to say is, that's not the only thing the text could be interpreted as saying, and you, you can interpret it differently without destroying the meaning of the story mm -hmm. and without violating uh, our faith in scripture, okay? Some people wanna make this, if you don't believe in a global flood, then you don't believe that the scriptures are true. And I wanna say, no, that's not the case. Many folks, hundreds of thousands and millions of folks throughout time, throughout history have believed that the flood was local and they believe in the authority of scripture. It's it's not a big stretch. Um, and I just, I just want to make that point. And that's, you, you know, you've noticed that's a point I want to make a lot because I, I, I want us to focus in on the things in scripture that really are make or break of our faith and not the things that aren't. Other observations from Genesis, <laughs> from page 12 and page 13. So what did you see? Debt. Say again? Debt. Debt? All life died. Oh, God death. Flooded oh, yeah. out. Do I sound, I sound funny when I talk? No, that's great. I just didn't get it. I just didn't get it. I'm Jamaican, yeah. We love, we love that. We love your accent. We always take so E-B-T. Death. This is exactly what God had promised, right? He was going to kill everything in which the breath of life uh, was. So there's a lot of death. Everything dies. Um, so God did what God promised. Other observations, things that you saw. On page 12 or further on, or it doesn't matter. Uh, you can go on 13. Oops, because we're at, we're at 8 o'clock now. Let's, let's go into 12 and 13. Um, Fruitful multiply came up a couple of times. Be yeah, okay, so let's, let's do that. So fruitful and multiply. Be fruitful and multiply. Is that the first time we've heard this? No. Nope. 
Where else have we heard the command to be fruitful and multiply? All the way back in the beginning, right? In the beginning, right? So, so what we're seeing here is echoes of creation, right? Let's start again. So this is a recreation, right? It's a, it's a, it's a let's start again. Great. That's a great way to put it, Sue. This is a great, this is a, a let's start again. Now notice, just here's the fun thing to notice, right? Notice the order in which things happen, right? Uh, Noah and his family are in the ark, right? And then, uh, and, and, the, and the earth is covered with water, right? And a wind from God blows on the water. Where have we seen that before? In the beginning, right? And then the, when the wind blows on the earth, well then dry land appears. Okay, that's the next thing that happens in Genesis uh, chapter one, right? And then, and then there's this search for vegetation and eventually vegetation appears, right? And then after the vegetation appears, the yeah. animals go out from the ark, right? Uh, birds and animals and every creeping thing go out of the ark. And then finally, Noah and his family go out of the ark. It's the exact same order of creation is what happens after the flood, right? We go from the, the, the waters that cover everything to the wind from God, to the dry land appearing, to vegetation, to birds, and then animals, and then man. It's six days of creation all over again. Be fruitful and multiply on the earth. It's God's blessing and it's God's command because the flood is a recreation story. Now, if the flood is a recreation story, who is Noah? Adam. Adam. Adam, okay? So I just wanna put that out there, okay? Noah, if this is a second creation story, Noah is a second Adam. And you wanna keep your eyes open for ways in which Noah and Adam are similar, okay? They're gonna be different, but there's, there's going to be some similarities there. How many sons does Noah have? Three. Three. How many sons did Adam have that we know the names of? Three. Three. Uh, okay. That's cool. That's interesting. That's just one, option, one little parallel. But there's many more um, of, of how Noah is a second Adam for the world. What else did you see? We forgot the dove. The dove, okay. The raven first. We have the raven, oh, yeah. and then the dove, and the dove gets to go out twice. Yeah. Uh, That's interesting. Th what interests you about this? The what dove interests went you? twice, the raven only went once. Is there something about types of bird and what they're oh, able to do? Oh, yeah, well, that's very interesting. Um, Ravens are usually one. trickers. Yeah. Okay, and even more so, is there a biblical category that ravens are in yeah. and that doves are not? Yes. Or that raven and doves are in different biblical categories? Yes. How does the Bible categorize animals? It's the two categories, the Bible categorizes animals. Clean and unclean. Clean and unclean, yes. Based on what they eat, okay? What do ravens eat? Dead animals, they're scavengers, okay? Yeah, but when, which, isn't there something, or I might have it wrong, the type of bird, when the prophet was in the wilderness and the Bible said, God sent ravens from heaven. You know, you're right, uh -huh. you're right. So, yeah. Yeah, so that's a, that's a very interesting story, and we'll get to that when we get to Second Kings. Um, <laughs> oh, <yes>. Sometimes. <laughs> That's I, I, that thought. I promise when we get to Second Kings, I'll talk about it. Uh, so, <laughs> so exactly, it's going to take seven years to get there. It's going to take seventy years to get there. Well, here we go. But uh, that's the fun of it, right? We go slow. Um, yeah. So ravens are unclean. Ravens are unclean because ravens, at least in part, their diet is a scavenging diet. Okay. Doves are clean. Um, there are uh, there are if a, in some ways. Uh, a dove is a more valuable animal to them because the dove is clean. Now, uh, Noah brought seven pairs of the clean birds 
on the ark. He only took, brought one pair of ravens with him, but maybe there's been more baby ravens. I don't know. Um, but yeah, so Noah sends the unclean animal out first, and then he sends the clean animal. And it's the clean animal that finds a place to stay. What else do you see? And the raven didn't come back. Well, it doesn't answer that. It just says that it went to and fro until the waters were dried up from the earth. But it never said that it stayed or came back. Yeah. Or maybe it just continued to go to and fro until the waters were dried up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, it, it, we don't it, know. It would suggest that the raven is a wild bird. It didn't want to come back to being cooped up in the ark. Yeah. Because oh, it, it never it came, came back. But I guess no one knew what the we, traits of we know that, that story has always perplexed me. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's what it means. When it went to and fro to the ark and back. Oh, maybe. Could be. Yeah. We don't we don't fully know what happens with the raven. We do know what happens with the dove. The dove comes back, right? And uh, she brings the, the olive leaf with her. Uh, and then uh, another seven days he sends forth the dove and she doesn't return to him anymore. Right. So she goes and she makes her makes her home out there. Yeah, good good observation. Somebody else, what else did you see? So Pastor, how do you know that there were seven pairs of doves brought onto the ark? Uh, earlier. Yeah. I guess I missed that somewhere. Page 10, I think it's page 10. Yeah, page 10. I am 20 of every living thing of all flesh. You shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They should be male and female of the birds, according to their kinds and the animal, according to their kinds, every creeping thing on the ground, two of every sort shall come to you and take you and, and you keep them alive. Also take going to page 11, every sort of food, etc., etc. Line four, take with you seven pairs of all clean animals. The oh, male, okay a pair of the animals that are not clean, the male and his mate, and seven pairs of the birds of the heavens also, male and female, to keep their offspring alive on the face of the earth. So uh, I believe that seven pairs there it's, uh, of birds, he's talking specifically about the clean birds. Mm -hmm. um, because he's, he's said earlier that of the animals, seven pairs of the clean. Good question. All right, somebody else, observation. That, that brings me kind of what to one of the things that stuck out to me was on page 13, uh, line 15, the, um, the animals went out by families. Oh, families. Okay. That's, we just have to put a little big red circle around that word. That's an interesting word to use to talk about uh, animals, right? Families are important to God and to this story. Families are important to this story. You have Noah's family, but the animals also have families. And there's this family sense and going out of the ark in families. Um, that's just a cool observation. Yeah, right. Plus, so, would it also indicate since they went on there for 400 and over a year, they had that they babies. had that's what I thought too. That's what I'm thinking. So they, they reproduce on the ark. That's a that's distinct possibility. Yeah, a distinct possibility. Um, my family, we watched the Noah movie. I told you the, the Noah movie that I recommend that you're gonna hate. Right? Yeah, so there you go. <laughs> Who are those stone people? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very weird. It's a weird movie, right? It's a very weird movie. I'm not saying this is an accurate depiction of the flood story, but it, it highlights some very interesting things, right? And one of the things that it had in it was that they put all the animals to sleep, right? They had a, sort of this, this uh, pharmaceutical sleep that they put all the animals to sleep during the entire time that they were on the ark. Um, that's, I don't know if that's what happened, but that's an interesting idea anyway. And sort of how do you, how do you stop the animals from, you know, rampaging all over the ark? Well, you know, maybe God kept them calm, you know, whatever. Uh, God certainly brought the animals to Noah. There's a great sequence where uh, first the uh, the birds come to the ark, and they like, they they like block out the sky as the birds come in and they fly into the ark and they settle, and then uh, come the snakes and the bugs. And Noah's wife is like, "Yeah, not happening." Snakes, Noah. Are we really taking the snakes? And Noah's like, "We're taking the snakes. Yeah, we're taking the snakes." 
Yeah. There's some great stuff in that movie. You're gonna hate it or love it, one or the other. <laughs> nobody's nobody's, nobody's in, between in between on this movie. All right. Uh, yes. Observations. Somebody else. Someone else an observation. Um, specific instruction: bring out with you. Go out of the ark. Go out from the ark, right? Line yeah. ten. And so bring this with you. Bring and bring, what you should bring out, right? So God had given them a command to go in. To and go in. And how to come out? It's right. So they went in by God's command. Uh, that would be page eleven, line three. Go into the ark. And then they went out at God's command, page 13, line 10. Still on this idea that Noah did everything that the Lord commanded him, right? God gives him a command, Noah does it. He goes into the ark by God's command, he goes out of the ark by God's command. So what does Noah do after they leave the ark? Build an altar. Noah builds an altar and sacrifices to the Lord. Okay, what is this? What is going on? Why does no? What is Noah doing when he sacrifices to the giving Lord? Thanks. Giving thanks. Giving thanks is worship. Yeah, the blanket term is worship. It probably is a thanksgiving offering. He's giving, thanking the Lord for saving their lives, um, and and the Lord says in His heart, right? Heart has been an important word in the Noah story. Uh, every inclination of man's heart was only evil all the time, right? Lord, the Lord was grieved in his heart. And now the Lord says in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man for the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Ne neither will I str ever again strike down every living thing as I have done. And he gives this solemn pledge, right? You know, the earth remains, seed time and harvest cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. Right? God makes this solemn vow. He's not going to do this particular thing again. Now there's an interesting little pun here. And there's a, this, this pun happens a bunch of times in the story in different ways. But if you look at line 18, when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, okay? Pleasing uh, is the word Noah. Okay, it's uh, it's it's like a it's it's Noah uh, is what it is in in, in Hebrew. It's Noah, uh. and so it, it's a pun on Noah's name. There's a lot of puns on Noah's name in this story. Uh, uh, when the ark comes to rest on Mount Ararat, rest is Noah. Okay, remember that Noah's dad had said, "I'm going to name you Noah because you're going to bring us rest from our toil." Okay, mm -hmm. so the ark comes to rest on Mount Ararat, and then God God smells the 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 restful aroma, right? The pleasing aroma. Um, this is this is what Lamech Noah's father had said would be the case, coming to pass. Okay, Noah is bringing rest. He, he brings the ark to rest. The ark comes to rest, but then Noah brings rest to the Lord's heart. He he brings this sacrifice, which is a restful aroma, a pleasing aroma to the Lord. Very good. What else did you see? Um, what stood out to me was when God said, he still recognized that even going forward, the intention of man's heart would still be evil from yeah. a young age, but he's not... It would be like he's saying, well, for every generation, I can't just be wiping out, you know, right. every generation because of evil. So to me, in seeing that, a plan of salvation was like he knew from the beginning mm -hmm. the plan of salvation was already there. The flood may have wiped out all the people, but it did not wipe out all the evil, okay? Yeah. Um, the only people left are Noah and his family. And the Lord says, every inclination of your heart is still evil, right? Right. Uh, so, I mean, this is... This is Noah's righteousness is a righteousness that's, you know, it's, it's a God's righteousness that's been imputed to him. Um, but, uh, but eliminating the people did not eliminate the evil. Noah and his family are still carrying that evil with them. And we'll see a lot more about that in the next passage um, as, we, as we see how the second Adam uh, 
lives in this new Eden, right? Does the second Adam fall? We'll, we'll find out, right? Um, but yeah, the wiping out of, of the evil people didn't wipe out evil from the earth. If that was the intent, uh, which it wasn't, if, if the intent was to wipe out all evil, then, then the flood didn't work. But that wasn't the intent. The, the intent was to restrain evil by now containing it to the covenant family. Uh, so we start back again with just one family that's in covenant with God. Although it's, it is funny and fun that God, does it say this here? No, I won't say that yet. Say that next week. All right, let's, let's uh, move on here. So we've done a lot of observation and we've done a lot of looking. There's a lot of fascinating things that we notice in this story. Let's listen to the text. What is this text trying to teach us? Okay. What does this text mean? What's the, what's the point? What, why is, what is this text teaching us about God? What is it teaching us about people? What is it teaching us about the world that we live in? What's it teaching us about salvation? As you're listening to this text, what do you hear that this text is teaching, not to you specifically, but to everybody? What's, what's the point? I think from the beginning, um, the idea of consequences for sin. So there are consequences for sin. Specifically, death. Right? Okay. Esther, I, it's Carol. I I see that God really hates sin. I mean, to destroy His creation, He must have. He must really hate sin. God hates sin so much it led to the flood. Okay, which I'll, I'll just call judgment. Right, it led to read it led, and and this is an important truth for us in the New Testament era, just as much as it is in the Old Testament era. Very good. What else? What else? Patience, patience waiting on God. His time is not necessarily our time. God's timing <laughs> requires patience. Long time on the ark. It was a long time. On the ark. <laughs> and a long time to build it. It was a long time to build it, and it was a long. You know, we were we've been in quarantine, right, and lockdown for over a year. We know what it's like, right, to to be cooped up. <laughs> Not as much as Noah does, right? But perspective, as yeah. as frustrating as it was for us, it had to have been just as hard or more for Noah and his family. And your house, I don't think. Your house was pitching up and down on the waves. You didn't so. have curbside delivery. <laughs> That's right. So the, the dove is an Uber. Uber eats. All right. What else? Uh, what, what else is this, is this passage teaching? Kind of not expand on what Carl said, but kind of piggyback off that. He hates sin, but yet there is always something leading towards redemption and forgiveness yes. for us. All right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna write this out as God remembered Noah, right? <laughs> um, God remembered Noah. Uh, and that's that is God's grace, God's covenant, faithfulness. And also him saying he will never do that again. It's like sure, yeah, okay, very good. And and uh, so uh, God judgment will be tempered by mercy. Yeah. Now, God remembering Noah is, of course, the center of the Noah story. Okay, this is the the point. Uh, and when you go to the New Testament, and the New Testament interprets the Noah story, here's what the New Testament says. In in I think it's Second Peter. Peter writes. Peter tells tells a little bit of the Noah story, and he says. The Noah story teaches us that God is able to save the righteous while he's judging the wicked, right? God is able to save the righteous while he's judging the wicked. Well, that was very important for the people of Peter's day to hear, right? People of Peter's day were being persecuted by the Christians of Peter's day were being persecuted by the people around them. 
Peter's talking in Second Peter about the, the sort of suffering that Christians endure for righteousness sake. And what Peter's saying is, look, judgment is coming and God is going to be able to save you from that judgment, just like he was able to save Noah. Okay. Uh, this idea that God is able to save his people uh, through in the midst of judgment is a critical piece of how the New Testament looks at the Noah story. And in fact, uh, it is the centerpiece of the flood story, is God saving his people through, um, through the judgment. And then um, when Andy said something about you know, God being patient, and earlier on it said his timing is different from our timing. Mm -hmm. And I'm just, it's just clicking here when he says, as long as the earth remains, seed time, harvest, cold, heat, summer, winter, day and night shall not cease. So make me think they had experienced different seasons, but while they were in the ark, they didn't know if it was Sunday, Monday, or if it was 12 o'clock in the, the night or 12 o'clock in the day. Mm. It's like for them, time had ceased to exist. Mm. I mean, they couldn't see out. They didn't, all they, I guess, heard was the pounding rain. So again, to me, stress the importance of God mercy and allowing us to be able to have different season, nighttime, daytime. God has established a new order for the earth, the continuation of the order of the earth. And it's a, it's a continuation that he's going to keep going until the end, right? Uh, as long as the earth endures, uh, God will maintain that order uh, for the earth. Somebody else, somebody on the, on Zoom, what do you, what do you hear God, what do you think that God is saying through this story to all of us at all times? There's a, there's a bit of a risk in unmuting yourself on Zoom. It's diff more difficult. The Zoomers are all asleep. <laughs> <laughs> Except you, Carol. <laughs> Is there something good on television? I know, right? <laughs> that was funny. All right. Well, I'll give a couple more minutes. Something else that you, that you believe, what is this text teaching us? What does this text teach us about God? What is this? We we talked about how God hates sin. God has time that requires patience, but God is faithful to His people. God judges. What does this, what does this text teach us about humanity? We're in need of a need of a savior. We need saving. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are we about the same thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I'm gonna say God makes promises. And he keeps them. Okay, God makes and keeps promises. Yeah. I think the idea of God making promises is just, yeah. I mean, that's a huge thing that we just does need to skip right over. We just keep saying, you know, he keeps his promises. Yeah. But the idea that he makes promises yeah. to people to. that that are you. He's God. He doesn't yeah. have to promise us anything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah. That's that is cool. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Somebody else, something else that you feel this passage is teaching. Esther, could I just read that to Peter to nine scripture? I, it really is jumping out at me. The one that I think you just mentioned. Peter 2.9. Yeah, so, so it says, so you see, the Lord knows how to rescue godly people from their trials, even while keeping the wicked under punishment until the day of final judgment. That just sums it all up for me. Yeah, that's powerful, powerful, powerful. There are other ways that the New Testament refers to the Noah story. One of them, one of them is talking about how Noah preached to the people uh, so it says, I think it's in, uh, I want to say James, no, not James, Jude. I think Jude talks about how Noah preached to the people uh, and they didn't listen, right? So that's another, another way that the New Testament uses the story of Noah. But, but, this, but this idea that God is able to save the righteous, even while holding the wicked for judgment, this is the, the main theological point that the New Testament draws from this Noah story.
Yeah. It was interesting that she read that because the verse before that was, Peter was implying that Noah was tormented in his soul, living among such evil. And I think about that because when I think about what's happening now in our world, and I'm thinking if I feel this way, how must God feel? So yeah. it's very yeah. interesting. Very good. And I said God will always take care of us. God will always take care of us. I think that's Alright, let's take a minute now. We've we've looked, we've listened, okay? And now the we want to ask, what is it that God wants to incorporate into our lives? How do we want to live? How are we going to live differently as a result of the passage that we've studied tonight? What is God saying to you specifically? What, why did God want you to study this passage tonight? Uh, I want you to just take, some, take a minute and let's listen to the Lord, to his spirit. What is he saying in our hearts? And then write out what is it that you feel like god is saying to you to obey from this actually no, Heavenly father i just ask that you would speak to our hearts even now lord of every person who's within the sound of my voice help us to to listen to you and to hear what you're wanting to say to us specifically tonight I haven't taught on this yet, so I'll teach on it now. Um, when it comes to applying the scriptures, there's a lot of ways in which the passage might be applied to your life. One is uh, that there might be a command in the passage, right? Maybe there's a command that you need to obey. Okay, that's one way in which the scripture might apply to you. Maybe there's a command to obey. Maybe there's an example for you to follow or avoid, right? Maybe the text has an example uh, for you to follow or to avoid. Maybe there is, uh, maybe there is a truth that you need to embrace, right? Something that's there's a truth that you need to embrace and incorporate into your life. Uh, maybe there's a warning that you need to heed, right? Um, there's lots of different ways in which the, the scripture might speak to you. Lots of different uh, ways that you might apply the scripture to your life. Um, let me ask, is there anybody who has something that you've written down that you feel like I can share this uh, with the group. How has God been speaking to you tonight? So Pastor, my, while we were just praying, the Lord was just speaking to me that I can please God in his heart by following his commands, which yeah. is, kind of what you were saying too. Amen. Yeah, you can please God's heart by obeying his commands. Excellent. That's great. Thank you, Corinne. Somebody else, what, is, what was God saying to you specifically tonight? 
made me realize that, I mean, we throw this around a lot, you know, I'm blessed, I'm blessed. Mm -hmm. But it made me realize that I'm truly blessed to have been redeemed mm -hmm. and to have a covenant with a holy and righteous God. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Amen. Amen. I don't know if you heard that, but Nicole said she feels truly blessed that she is redeemed and can have a covenant with a true and holy God. That's great. Somebody else? What does God say to you? You can look to him for and through all things. Mm -hmm. You can look to God for and through all things provides right and and you can look to god through all things and he also reveals yeah very good somebody else what does god say to you i had it's more like a truth embrace of endure i will always be at your side oh wow okay yeah you can endure because god will always be at your side it sounds like a uh yeah a, a truth you can endure it sounds like a command almost but that's a promise there, right? I'll always be by your side. Amen. If you're in a covenant with God, he's going to be faithful to you. This is the, this is the bottom line, right? That uh, God's not going to forget you. He's right. not going to leave you high and dry, I guess. But <laughs> <laughs> we hope you, I mean, in this case, we hope you floating. He's not going to leave you floating. <laughs> leave you hanging. Uh, God's totally, he's, he's going to, he's, you're, you're on his mind. He doesn't forget you. He remembers you. Yeah, amen. Amen. Part of the reason we share these is because I want you to hear from each other the truth of Scripture, right? Um, it is a. I was talking with a um, with our international worker actually. I was talking about an international worker this week. Uh, I got to take him out to lunch a couple of times, and uh, he was talking about how in the country where he serves in Bosnia. Uh, there's a, a sense among sort of the traditional Christians in Bosnia that uh, that the truth can only come from a pastor, right? Mm -hmm. uh, a priest uh, or a pastor, in whatever tradition they're in, that, that uh, truth and leadership have to come from the clergy, right? And so uh, one of the tr things that... Uh, our international worker emphasizes with the folks that he's ministering to is that God has equipped the body of Christ to minister to the body of Christ. And that truth can be taught from all corners. It's not just a pastor. It's not just a pastor who can administer the sacraments. It's not just a pastor who can teach the word. It's not just a pastor who can encourage and strengthen. And you guys, through this study, you get to hear each other teaching the word. And I, I love that. That makes my heart glad as a pastor who, who my goal is to see us all, you know, ministering to one another through the word. And, and that's why I want you to share at the end, because I want, I, not because I want to pry into your life, but I want what, what God is saying to you to resonate in each other's lives. Amen. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to pray and then I'll open it up for any final questions uh, before stopping the recording. Let me, uh, I'm glad you feel that way. I do. <laughs> That's good. Just I'm like, I can't be tired to go. It's every time, every time it flies for me, and I'm like, that was fast. And I'm, I sit here in dread, like, I hope it didn't drag for people. <laughs> Let, let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for this passage. Thank you that uh, you inspired this passage so that it might instruct us, that it might encourage us, that it might challenge us, that it might warn us, that it might uh, develop our trust in you. Lord, I pray that um, the truth that you've spoken to our hearts tonight would find good soil in our hearts so that we would take what you've given us, meditate on it, make it the, 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 the food that we, that we eat spiritually this week so that we might allow it to grow fruit in our lives. Lord, help us to be good soil. Um, we saw the dove pluck the freshly plucked olive leaf just after a, a few weeks of, of dry land. Already the, the earth was sprouting vegetation. Lord, may, may we be that kind of good soil that's already sprouting olive leaves uh, quickly out of our lives. Lord, uh, if, if you've convicted us of sin, Lord, I pray that we would 
move away from that sin and repent it, uh, for, repent from it before you and receive your forgiveness and walk in a different way. If you've given us encouragement, Lord, in areas where we need to be strengthened, Lord, I pray that you would give us courage there and help us to walk in that truth. Lord, if, you've, if we've seen here an example of what we want to follow or what we want to avoid, Lord, I pray that you'd help us to, to see that, that truth out in the world around us so that we can apply it day by day. Lord, you are God and you're speaking to us and we thank you. And we thank you for the gift of one another that we can learn from one another and hear your word preached by one another. And we can be, in, we can be strengthened in our inner person because of the ministry that we each have with, an, with, with one another. Thank you for this word. Thank you for this group. Thank you for this time. Lord, I pray that you watch between us as we go our separate ways, bring us back together on Sunday for our Sunday morning service and bring us uh, back together next Wednesday for the study and other times in between. Uh, and may you be glorified in our lives, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, everybody. And open for just free chat on the passage or whatever. I, Pastor, it's Carol again. Who's, I'm wide awake here. Um, <laughs> I, I'm not too sure I understand the beginning of this one sentence. I think I know what it means, but it's, I don't know, just the way it's written. It's on, it's 13. Um, line six, the beginning of that sentence in the 601st year. 601. 601st year of what? Is that, is that because Noah was 600 and then this was the next year after his 600th birthday or something? Yeah. Yeah. Noah was 600 when the flood started, right? That's and, okay. Back on. Where was that? That was page 13. Page 11. Oh. oh, where it, where it first was mentioned. In the 600th year of Noah's life. In the 11. It was, it was 11, 15. In the 600th year of Noah's life, right. So this is the 600th year of Noah's life and, and the first year. And the 601st year, yeah. Right. So, and it's, it actually says the 600th year in the second month on the 17th day. And then the flood ends. That's when this flood starts. And the flood ends on the, in the 601st year, the first month, the first day. So just under. Oh. Okay. Got it. I thought that's what it meant, but wow. On the earth. And that's then a thinker. That's a thinker, that one. Line nine in the second month on the 27th day of the month. So now a, a month. I guess almost two months later is when it says the earth had dried out. That's okay. a fascinating little thing. If you want to do a, a short little study on that, uh, what's the difference between line seven and line uh, nine and 10, right? Where the earth, uh, waters were dried from the earth in line seven and the earth had dried out lines nine and 10. Um, are those two different kinds of dry? They're actually two different words in Hebrew, um, mm. so, uh, which I think of personally, I think of as the difference between my, my it's no longer raining and the puddles have disappeared in my backyard, uh, but uh, if I, still if I but it's still wet, right? 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 right. Versus I can mow this thing. Yeah. yeah. Mm. I love to mow. Yeah. <laughs> Yesterday, <laughs> you told me I needed to mow. I'm like, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah good observation carol cool that's carol without an e yes i heard, I heard that in my pronunciation yeah have any of you seen the Noah movie and nicole has she uh, like i have i saw it too i have hated it <laughs> it's not a bad movie. I mean, you have Russell Crowe. It's got Russell Crowe in it. It's not a bad movie. I think the problem I Amen. have with it is I have the concept that if you're going to depict something yes. from the Bible, you should 
stick with what the Bible says. That was just my thing. Yep, yep, yep. And then I got confused. Who are these rock men? Rock men. I mean, like I'm thinking Optimus Prime would do a better thing because I love Optimus Prime. I could not. <laughs> I could marry well, Optimus, Optimus Prime. Prime. I mean, that'd, be, that'd be a good movie. I could. And then I'm thinking <laughs> the man who stole away from the, the evil guy. Oh, right. Right. Then did our son turn against him like he was about to stab him? I'm like, what's going on here? <laughs> and then Noah was gonna kill the baby. I'm like, what on earth is this not? <laughs> I think I got caught oh, up in God. what was biblical and what wasn't. And, I, and, yep. and, 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 and that was uh, my problem. What, what, what is biblical about it is that uh, this idea that they're bringing evil with them on the ark. Not mm. and it's not just the bad guys. Mm. Their evil is, is within their hearts, and 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 Noah, in the movie, Noah thinks that it's God's purpose to wipe out all evil, mm. and so that's why he wants to kill the babies, right? Because he believes that people are evil, and all you know, all people need to be killed, right? And so Noah mishears God; he misunderstands God, and uh, and that's one of those just interesting things. I I find that fascinating. But was it just that, or was it before she became pregnant, she was supposed to be barren, and then the grandfather, I don't know if he had blessed her or said something, and then all of a sudden she could become pregnant because they yeah. thought she wouldn't have been a good wife because mm -hmm. she didn't have children. Yeah, yeah. So maybe that was why, because I remember Noah said, what have you done? Like, how could she now be able to have children? So I'm like, okay. Well, Noah's wife says in the movie, she's look, uh, Noah, maybe God has engineered all this. Yeah. And and that's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is that thanks, <laughs> thanks, Mrs. Noah. <laughs> Her name is Nama in the movie. So thanks, thanks, Nama. Uh, she she's uh, she says, well, you know, God has put you in a position to make the right choice. Uh, yep, yeah, that's that's great. Love you guys. I'm gonna stop the recording. I didn't know you were still